Hi, welcome to the fifth part of our series in designing and building a bench power supply system. Uh, in the previous videos, we've talked about voltage references, op amps, um, power stages, uh, or at least power circuits in general, and um, displays, how to display some analog current or voltage on some low cost uh, self-contained little meters. In this video, we're going to talk about specifically the output driver stage of a power supply uh, circuit. We're going to look at using bipolar junction transistors and MOSFETs, uh, both N-channel and P-channel, and a little bit about the characteristics of each. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to get into all the theory about electrons and field effects and all this kind of stuff. It's just going to be a practical um, talk about how to just wire them up and use them and how you drive them and some of the potential limitations including you know, the kind of voltage swings and the power dissipations and stuff like that. So the first thing um, before we get started I want to draw your attention to is the discussion is going to be about four different kinds of things. So we're going to look at an N-channel MOSFET, a P-channel MOSFET, an N-channel Darlington driver and a P-channel Darlington driver. So if I just bring your attention to the diagrams I have on the board at the moment, let me just adjust the camera here and zoom in. Okay. So what we have here, if you can see this okay, yep, is we have an N-channel MOSFET. This is the circuit for an N-channel MOSFET. We have a source which goes towards the negative. We have the drain of a MOSFET which goes up towards the positive side of a supply and we have the gate. So to turn this MOSFET on what we have to do is take the gate voltage positive with respect to the source voltage and at a certain point of around two or three volts and you know if it's a logic MOSFET it'll be about one volt but typically with most MOSFETs you have to check on the um, data sheet to see exactly what it is. It's a parameter commonly referred to as VGS, which is the volt gate gate to source. Um, it'll start to turn on. It's the threshold voltage you're looking at. So uh, it would typically be around three or four volts. I mean, it, it just depends on what the MOSFET is. All right. And we'll look at some of the exact specs for some in a little bit later in the video. Um, and as you take the voltage high, it turns the MOSFET on more. And a MOSFET is typically what you might look at as a voltage to current converter as opposed to um, an N-channel Darlington transistor, which is this next circuit across to the right here, which again, you've got the positive side, which is for an N-channel Darlington is the collectors, the negative side, which would be the emitters that are cascaded in series through, you've got the base feeding through the emitter, which is like a diode and that feeds the base of the next one which is through to the emitter which is another diode to the negative. Um, again you take the base positive with respect to the emitters as opposed to the gate positive with respect to the source but in this case this circuit is more of a uh, current amplifier. The current that you f feed through the base junction down towards the emitter is amplified by typically what is referred to as the HFE or the gain of the transistor which for um, a Darlington pair could be anything from a few hundred to potentially in excess of a thousand gain. Um, so if you say it was a thousand, we'll just keep the numbers easy, if you put one milliamp in here and the gain was a thousand, you would get approximately one amp flowing between the collector and the emitter. With a MOSFET, it doesn't work that way. Um, as, and I said, I'm not going to go into all the theory behind it, but basically as you hit the, uh, the gate source threshold, say that's one volt, um, as you increase this voltage, it's a voltage to current conversion, not a current to cur current conversion, which is the case with a N-channel uh, bipolar junction transistor. Um, there's also another interesting difference between the two of these. The MOSFET will, um, once it starts to turn on, it'll say it starts at about three volts. It will be fully turned on by the time it gets to maybe 4.2, 4.5 volts. Um, and 
beyond that, you really just can't turn it on any harder. It, as I say, depends on the, the type of MOSFET you've got and you need to refer to the specifications to be sure, but there's a limited range where you can actually have control of the MOSFET's output. Um, below the threshold, it's turned completely off, and if you go um, you know, up a couple of volts beyond that threshold, it's typically turned fully on. Now, there's a little bit of dependency between how many volts there are between the drain and the source, but that's pretty much how it works, and there's no current flowing from the gate to the source in the case of the MOSFET, whereas with an N-channel um, Darlington, you do have basically two diode drops across here, so there is a current flowing through the junctions towards the emitters. Um, and that's one of the reasons why with an N-channel MOSFET you absolutely must put a current limiting resistor in the base so that you don't overload the circuit that's driving it. Now, before we get into sort of more detailed circuits, let's just go and have a look at the um, P-channel of each of these as well, which uh, what happens here, the biggest difference you can notice here is that source is now on the positive end of the MOSFET and the drain is at the bottom end. And the difference mainly is that the, you've, you've reversed the voltage control system on here. You've still got a gate to source differential, but as a, with an end channel, remember we said it's, uh, the, the volt gate source goes positive. In the P channel, the volt gate source differential to turn it on is going negative. So as you bring the, the gate to a more negative voltage relative to the source, it will start to turn on. Now typically there is a difference of a volt or two um, between the threshold of the N-channel MOSFET and a P-channel MOSFET, but outside of that, the, the circuitry, the way it works from all practical purposes, is pretty much the same. You'll get about a couple of volts deviation on the gate once you've got to the threshold between being partly on and being fully on, um, and that's the same either way. It's just the volts are reversed for the control system. Um, for the N channel over here, let me just move that across a little bit. Um, for the P, sorry, for the P channel bipolar junction transistor Darlington pair, um, in this case now the emitter is at the positive end instead of the emitter being at the negative end, and the collectors are more negative. And what happens now is the same as the P channel MOSFET, you bring the base negative with respect to the emitter now instead of positive. But the same thing applies as what we had with the N-channel uh, bipolar junction Darlington pair. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Darlington or just a single transistor, the principle is the same. The current that's flowing out of the base in this case is amplified by the gain of the Darlington pair. And so if, you, if this again has a gain of 1,000, um, then one milliamp flowing out of the base would try to pass one amp through the emitter to the collector. So for each of these there are certain limitations that you have to pay attention to, attention to when you're driving circuits. The first one is that whatever this voltage is here for the N-channel Darlington array, so say that's 12 volts, the output voltage here can never be closer to the positive rail than the drop across these two transistors because um, unless you take the base above the voltage of the collector and then you start risking doing potentially some damage to the um, transistor because you will actually get current flowing up through the uh, base collector junction as well because that's really, the, the, if you think of a transistor as diodes this way and diodes this way. Um, so as you take this up, you've got to say, the, say each of these is um, 0.6 volts, then this is always 1.2 volts higher than here. Um, and if you can't take this, if you're not taking it above the supply rail, say that's 10 volts, then the highest this could potentially go is about 8.8 .8 volts because of the drop across these. Now, you wouldn't want to go that high because if your supply that is driving this has any ripple on it, because maybe it's just a transformer with um, a couple of capacitors and a bridge rectifier uh, without a huge amount of smoothing, it will have a little bit of ripple on it. So if you've got a power supply that's got this on here and you're trying to output this volt um, that's getting into this area of the ripple, then it's going to get reflected on the output of the power supply. So you really don't want to do that if you can help it. 
with now as I say the limit of this is how high you can take this it's the 1.2 volts assuming 0.6 volts for each diode with a p-channel Darlington transistor array as you bring this down because the emitter is connected directly to the positive rail you won't start to turn the output on until you get to the 1.2 volts below the power rail but once you're there this is now acting purely as a current amplifier all right up in this area this is acting as an emitter follower so the output will basically always follow the input of the base on the we go back on the end channel in case you haven't noticed um, within the 1.2 volts all right so as you vary this up and down this will follow it um, up to the limit of about 1.2 volts below the supply rail with the P channel you've got 1.2 volts on here before this starts to turn on but once this does turn on you can drive this up and your output with load across here which there here's your zero volts as long as you're able to drive the current here you'll have your base uh, sorry your emitter collector volt drop which might be say one volt with a typical um, bipolar junction transistor once this is saturated um, you'll be able to get the output voltage here up to the current but your current is dependent on how much you pull through the base as opposed to here where the, you've got a current gain but you're also limited to being an emitter follower um, based on the, the topology of this and you can look up the theory of all of this if you want to uh, by just simply googling, googling it or looking on Wikipedia so I'm not going to go into the in depth of the theory now with the MOSFETs going back to this side again remember what I said there's a um, the gate from the threshold up to the fully turned on position um, is probably about you know sort of 1.4 volts or 2 volts depending on the transistor that you're dealing with um, you have a much smaller range swing on the input of this to control it so any control circuitry um, has to be has to have less noise on the end channel or the p channel Darlington transistors it's purely current and you know with with the end channel you're you're doing an emitter follower so if you have a very little bit of ripple here you're still going to get a very little bit of ripple here on here if you've got a little bit of ripple in current it's going to get magnified to the output because of the gain of this transistor um, with a MOSFET because it's a voltage to current conversion and you've got a limit of say um, let's just call it one volt for the sake of the math if you've got a few millivolts of um, ripple that's on this input it's going to get magnified to here because you're converting the volts to the current and you've only got say one volt swing between being off and on fully on so your output here is going to be very much affected by how stable this driving circuitry is um, with the p-channel it the, the exact same thing applies just you're going in the opposite direction now having said that that's that's the basic way that each of these things work for um, just driving them directly but how does that relate to our power supply well if I erase some of this for a moment and we'll start going through it we'll start with the bipolar junction transistors and then we'll work towards the MOSFETs okay so let's just uh, stop the video I'll clear the board and we'll start with the end channel um, Darlington transistor okay so just basically scribbled up a very um, simplistic view of a power supply um, we've got a 24 uh, sorry a 20 volt supply here which is our um, input to the power supply from our transformer rectifier smoothing stage um, we're going to go into that in another video so let's just assume we have 20 volts here for the moment we've got zero volts here we have our NPN Darlington transistor in the middle here we're going to use the TIP 120 as a typical device because it's quite popular and it's relatively cheap you can get them for less than a couple of bucks each um, things to remember now is you've got a maximum current through the base to the emitter of 120 milliamps um, but your voltage drop between the base and the emitter can be as much as two and a half volts and remember this configuration is a um, emitter follower so if you are only driving the base current the base up to 20 volts 
then the maximum this can get to is only 17.5 volts. Okay, um, I've put a 20 ohm load here, which typically if this could turn fully on, this would be um, 20 ohms, 20 volts would be one amp. All right, now because we also, the other parameter for the transistor is its um, collector, your collector emitter voltage at um, an amp to five amps is as much as two volts. That means even if we were able to turn this on and we took this voltage up enough to get the full um, current flowing through here that the load required, you still would be dropping two volts here. So if you had a supply up here of 20 volts, the maximum you could get here is 18, which is still, if you look at this, you've got 1.7 here. It's because there's a little bit of a drop in here as well. So your output is effectively limited to about naught to 17.5 volts because you've got this drop here and your supply that is um, providing your output stage is only 20 volts. So how can you resolve this? All right, we're not worried about the current here. You can have, you know, I put a 1K resistor here, but you could pretty much have any resistor here to limit the current um, through the base. You know, you could make that 100 ohms in this case, as long as the drive stage was able to provide the current all right, because you're running in an emitter follower mode here. So the way you can fix that is by increasing your supply voltage. So right now, if I had, um, you know, maybe a 15 volt transformer, that's not going to give you enough to get up here. So um, if I have 20 volts up on my DC supply before I go through my transistor stage, that means that I've probably only got about 14 volts AC, um, maybe a fraction higher from my transformer to give me the 20 volts DC out. Now, why is it 14 volts? Well, typically the math to go from volts AC at 50 hertz sine wave is you multiply the volts AC by 1.414 and that gives you the v volts DC peak output. Now, depending on how good your capacitors are that are smoothing this output, because remember you're, you're starting off with um, an AC voltage like this, when you rectify it, all right, you're going to take off this side, and now you're going to have this, all right, so it's all positive. And then when you add smoothing to it, all right, what it's going to end up with is because you're drawing current out of this as well, remember, you're going to end up with a supply voltage that has this kind of characteristic on the top of it. Now, this may only be, you know, a few, a few millivolts to, you know, maybe a couple of hundred millivolts. But either way, it's still there. It's never, ever going to be perfectly smooth unless you're drawing no load from it whatsoever. In which case, the capacitors would charge up to pretty much the V peak, which will be the 1.414 times the AC voltage. Um, less, of course, the volts you're dropping in your bridge rectifier, which could be another one or two volts. So, you know, I've got the math here saying 16 volts AC equals 22.6 volts um, DC out. But really, if that's what your transformer is, you probably actually want to have um, an 18 volt transformer or even a 20 volt transformer um, in order to get some higher volts out of it. So with this 20 volts here, it's probably going to be around about a 15 or 16 volt transformer that you're using. Um, so going back to how we drive this circuit up here, 20 volts, less than two volts from the collector to the emitter, right? When you're drawing a lot of current through this thing is going to give you naught to 18 volts, but you've got to also remember that you're going to have the, your emitter can never be better than about two and a half volts. You can't guarantee it to be better than two and a half volts below the base voltage. All right. Now that's assuming that you're driving enough current through here to uh, provide enough load for this, because there still is a gain based on the current. All right. So you want to av avoid having fluctuations in your load affecting your DC output. So you want to have enough current here um, to be able to cope with that. So 
you've got tw two volts here, one point two point five volts here. So really, if you consider the fact that you're dropping at least two and a half volts in this transistor stage to your output, and the fact that you may have a few, you know, just assume say a couple of hundred millivolts of ripple when you're under load on your power supply, then you know before you go through your regulation stage, then you really want to increase the voltage now. You know, 16 volts AC will give you about 22.6, less the diode, so that'll be giving you maybe nearer, you know, 21 volts. That's still not enough. So you actually probably want to have um, about 20 volts AC here, which is going to give you about 28 volts on the output. Because remember, it's 1.414, so um, 14 volts for every 10 volts, so 20 volts in is going to give you about 28 volts out. So if you have 28 volts up on the rail, let me just rub this out and put some extra markings on um, so we can follow through now. So we'll increase this now to be, there goes my eraser, 28 volts. All right, now that's 28 volts, um, maybe a little bit less. So now our two volts means that we could technically go up to about 26 volts or two and a half here, you know, maybe 25 volts. This gives us plenty of headroom to be able to drive this up and still be able to get our 20 volts out. Okay, so a few considerations to worry about here. Now, if our load, remember we talked about power, we're just talking about one amp right now, but if our load is, um, maybe we want to set this to be one volt here. Let me just grab my eraser. So, just going to get rid of this resistor for a second. You need a resistor in here to limit the current, all right? But if we <coughs> just get rid of some of these other things just to make the circuit more visible, um, so because we've already talked about those, we don't need to have them in there anymore. Uh, get rid of that. Yeah. All right. Simplified circuit. So we've got 28 volts up here. If we want to have um, one amp current, and we've set or we're setting this to be one volt, so that would mean a load of one ohm here. All right, then one volt here. You've got 28 volts up here. That means across here, you've got 27 volts. All right, at one amp, that's 27 watts. Now, 27 watts is an awful lot of power that you're going to be dissipating as heat. So that's going to have to have a big heat sink to be able to get rid of that. And, you know, even though you're nowhere near the power capacity of this, you're certainly going to be starting to heat things up. All right, now this is just the driver stage. We're not talking about current limiting or anything like that right now. We're just talking about driving a volts out and what will happen when you have you know, low voltages here and you have an extreme voltage across the output stage of your uh, power supply. You're going to be generating a lot of heat. All right? This is one of the reasons why bench power supplies are actually very inefficient when they're linear. They give you very good voltage control output, very smooth, but they're not efficient. Whereas a switch mode power supply um, you can actually get bench power supplies now that are based on switching technology. They're very, very efficient, but you do get a bit more noise on the output. So it's, you know, it's pros and cons. But a way to get around that with a lot of power supplies, which if you ever have access to a uh, professional um, Agilent, Keith Lee, or you know, there's the BK Precision or any of these um, fairly good linear bench power supplies, as you start turning the volts up, you will actually hear relays clicking inside, um, with the exception of maybe some of the really expensive power supplies where they're using solid state switching. And what's happening is as the relays are switching, um, they're switching in different tappings on the transformer. So, you know, if you only want one volt here, it's actually going to only pick maybe um, a, five, a very low voltage tapping on the transformer, and maybe you only have this as maybe you know, somewhere between 5 and 10 volts. As you start cranking the voltage up that you want, it'll be, tap, it'll be switching in um, higher tappings on the transformer so that it can have the extra voltage up here to keep the volts out that you want. All right. So the bench power supply that I'm going to be building 
Um, I'm not going to have a lot of switching in it, but I am going to have um, a 15 volt and a 30 volt tap so that we can, you know, I can still minimize how much power dissipation there is. And my power supply is ultimately is going to have um, an 8 amp and a 4 amp output capability. So, you know, when I'm running at 30 volts, I'm only going to be able to have 4 amps. But if I'm running at 15 volts, then I'm going to be able to out drive on the output at about um, 8 amps. Uh, this is just be, this is the limitations of the transformer uh, more than anything else. So NPN transistor. Now the other so going back to this, so one of the limitations is it's an emitter follower mode. You cannot take this above this supply rail because you're going to there's a diode junction here, so you kind of get stuck with that and you don't want to damage the transistor. You're going to be dropping a lot of heat now what you're going to discover is it really doesn't matter what type of device you put here, whether it's a, a N-channel, P-channel, tran uh, bipolar transistor, or an N and P-channel uh, MOSFET. You still have this issue where if you've got, say, you know, like here, the 28 volts, and you've only got one volt out, you're still dropping 27 volts across this driver transistor at whatever current that you're drawing. So a bigger power supply, all right, remember this TIP120 is rated at 65 watts. If we wanted a power supply here that could supply 5 amps, then, you know, 27 volts at 5 amps, you're way over 100 watts here. You're um, probably closer, just under 150 watts of power dissipation. All right, so that would be, first of all, you'd be frying this transistor. So this TIP120 would be totally no good for a 5 amp power supply, even though the transistor is capable of driving it. The minute you try and output a low voltage and you don't bring this down, you're going to be frying this transistor. At higher voltages, it'll be okay, but at lower voltages, it's going to be no good. So that's one thing you need to consider. We, now, we haven't started looking at feedback to control this yet. We're just really talking about how to drive this output stage. If you were monitoring this, remember we've already done a, um, a quick tutorial on op amps. Um, so if you were going to be using an op amp to drive this, you'd have your op amp here. The output of this would be, you know, you just put a limiting resistor here, maybe, you know, 200 ohms or something like that. Um, your positive input here would be, say, your 0 to 20 volts, uh, 0 to 20 volts. Your negative stage here, this is just a very, very basic, um, you know, you're using an open loop gain here, would be connected to here, all right? So you set 20 volts here, this op amp will do whatever it can. Now, you got to remember, this has got to be connected to the 28 volts, so it can drive right up there. It'll do whatever it can on its output to make that feedback equal 20 volts. So if I crank this to 20 volts, this will feedback, and it would set this to 20 volts. What you've effectively done now, when we were working here, if I set 20 volts on here, I would actually only get about um, the 17 and a half volts over here because of these drops. Now, whatever I set on my circuit, that's what I'm going to get out here. So you've basically eliminated the voltage drop on this transistor. All right, it's it. You've just taken it out of the equation because your output here is now fed right back to your input. Now. I guess I might as well cover it off while we're here. Not to 20 volts there, that's quite a lot. And, you know, you're going to typically um, use a voltage reference to drive this thing. So say you selected a 2 volt voltage reference, all right? A very simple analog circuit, what you would do is you'd put a variable resistor. This would be connected to your um, 2 volt VREF. All right, so you've got two volts coming in. You can adjust this voltage here into the positive side of this op amp, anywhere between naught and two volts. Now, what you've got here is you can't just do this now because that means you'd never be able to exceed two volts here because it just that's what the positive is and it'll try and get it back. So you need to add some gain into this. Oh, sorry, more of a divider actually. So if we put a resistor in here, now this is standard op amp, op amp stuff when we covered this earlier and you put a resistor down here to ground we've got a divider network all right now the op amp still has to do whatever it can to get this negative input to the same as the positive input so if we made this um, say 10k and we made this 90k all right that's basically 100k 
and, and 10K, so that's a 10 to 1 ratio between the two of these. So for, if we've got 20 volt, if we want, if we set this to 2 volts on this input, all right, so we got 2 volts here, then this wants to be at 2 volts. So basically, if we've got 2 volts here, all right, this has to be 18 volts on here. Now, really, this is a current gain circuit. Remember, we went back earlier before where we said, you know, using Darlington transistors or any kind of standard bipolar uh, junction transistor, it is a current device. It's not really a voltage device the way the MOSFETs are. So what you need to worry about is what is the current flowing through here? So you've got 100K. So you've got about, um, I think, one microvolt. So one microvolt in, uh, sorry, two microvolts or 20 volts. So two microvolts, 10K is going to give you um, your two volts, the two or 20. And the rest of the volts is going to be dropped across here. Anyway, it's just, it's what it is, if you've got R2 and this is R1, the formula is R1 plus R2 over R1. All right. So in our case, if this is 90K, you've got um, 10K plus 90K over 10K. So ultimately that ends up with simply 100 over 10 equals a 10 to 1 ratio. All right. So 20 volts here would give you 2 volts here. We've set 2 volts on our V reference. The transistor really is irrelevant in the circuit. As long as you've got enough, that as long as this op amp is able to drive the base up enough, so 2.5 volts above what your output is, it's all going to work nicely. Now the same thing is going to apply um, even if that was a MOSFET in here. It would work in exactly the same way. You could literally take this out, drop in an end channel MOSFET, and it would still work. The op amp would automatically compensate for the fact that the MOSFET has a very narrow range. You know, if you monitored the volts here in this circuit with an end channel um, bipolar transistor, it's, you know, as you crank this from 0 to 2 volts, this is actually going to go from 0 all the way up to, um, you know, 22 and a half volts or something like that. And we'll actually try this on the bench um, a little bit later, but that's what you're going to have. Okay, so I think that pretty much gives us enough for the moment for the um, using an end channel Darlington transistor for the output stage. So remember, heat is not your friend. So you want to make sure you have enough of a heat sink on here to keep it cool in the worst conditions, which basically means if I short this out and this is now in a current limit mode, well, in this particular circuit, there wouldn't be a current limit except for what is capable of going right through here. If I did this right now and I shorted that out, I would be blowing a fuse because there's nothing to, to limit the current. Okay, So that's why it's important with a power supply to put something in that will detect the fact that you're drawing too much current and pull this voltage here down in order to stop that from happening. All right. We're going to cover how you do that later on. We've already looked at uh, some current sensing circuits and things like that uh, earlier on. As we start bringing this all together, you'll see how we'll incorporate those limiting factors. But for now, let's go and switch to the um, NPN transistor, uh, Darlington, and see how that works. Okay, in this drawing, what we've done is I've replaced the NPN transistor with a PNP Darlington transistor. In this case, I picked one that's um, as fairly close to the previous one we had, a, which was uh, you know, we had a TIP120 before. Now what I have is a TIP145. So its basic characteristics are fairly similar. I mean, it's got a slightly different current. It's only 125 volt rather than 150, um, and its gain characteristics are slightly different. But it's fairly close to what we had before. Only difference is mainly that it's PNP instead of NPN. So the biggest difference now is, you know, from a control perspective, is instead of taking the base from zero volts and slowly going up towards the positive rail to turn the transistor on and control the output, now what we have is, you know, it's not an emitter follower anymore. It's all now dependent on the currents 
that you're driving. So this is truly a current-to-current -current effectively converter. Um, if we want to have um, a certain voltage here, it depends on what the load current is going to be and depends on what current you're pulling through these emitter base junctions down to here. All right. So this voltage here has to go down instead of up to turn on. So down equals on, up is off, as opposed to up before was on and down was off. All right. Your load, let's just assume we have, um, in this case, we'll just say we have a 10 ohm load on here just to keep the math easy. Um, let's just go back to having a, um, a 20 volt supply here just for now as well because that's where we started before. Um, the same thing applies to the emitter base junction. All right? You're going to drop anywhere between you know, one and a half to two and a half volts across here. Um, I'm going to show you the specs in a moment and we'll have a look exactly what it is for this particular device. But let's just assume it's the same voltage right now, the two and a half volts across here, before this thing even starts to turn on. So that means that if this is 20 volts, the voltage on the input has to go to at least um, down to 17 and a half volts before the transistor starts to turn on. And then as it starts coming down below that, um, it's going to turn harder and harder on and try and drive more current through this. So if this is a 10 ohm load and we want to have 10 volts all right, here, that means we're going to have to have um, one amp flowing through this transistor. Now, if you remember, we said that the, you know, in, in this mode, it is very much dependent on the gain of the transistor. It's HFE. So in this case, it is still between 500 and 1,000. So we'll just go with 1,000 for the sake of the math to keep it easy. All right. So if it's 1,000 and we want one amp here, we actually have to be drawing out of this base one milliamp. All right. So we want to limit the current. So we're going to put a resistor in here. Let me just get rid of that for a second. All right. So if I've got 20 volts and I want to have one milliamp flowing through here, um, I basically, if that's 1K, I want to be dropping one volt across this resistor to get one milliamp. All right. 1K, one volt, one milliamp, which means that that's 20 volts. I've dropped two and a half here. All right. Remember that two and a half across here. That means this needs to be. Um, V plus minus 3.5 volts. So that's going to be about 16.5 volts here. All right. Now, if I want to have, and that's just giving me 10 volts because of, of my load. If I want to have, say, um, 500 milliamps, I have to start taking this up. So I only want to have half a volt across this. All right, which would give me half a milliamp because remember the gain is a thousand. So I only want a half a milliamp here. So I have to increase this voltage back up in order to reduce the current that I'm pulling through here um, in order to reduce the current flowing through here so that I keep my 10 volts. So if this load is only drawing 500 milliamps at 10 volts, my voltage here has to go up. So one of the obvious difference that now becomes apparent between the NPN transistor and the PNP transistor um, output stage is the NPN one tends to keep its output voltage on the emitter um, fairly constant even if you're varying the load providing there is enough current into the base to be able to maintain that output voltage and again we'll try this on the bench a little bit later with a PNP transistor it's all about the current so if I'm pulling a certain amount of current through here um, the voltage that I get across my load, it's going to be dependent on the current flowing through here now, not on, and the stability. If I change my load here, the output, the voltage across it is going to change because this current here doesn't change. It's two diodes. Uh, you know, I mean, they're high voltage drop across the diodes, but nevertheless, there's still two diodes here with a current um, being drawn through that, through the current limiting resistor to a specific um, voltage. So if this is sitting at 16 and a half volts, 
that means you've got your one milliamp here, which means you're trying to drive an amp through this. So, you know, if I reduce my load, this is still trying to drive an amp through, which means the volts is going to go up to try and make that current go through. So this configuration, you really have a hard time um, or a harder time trying to control the voltage that's coming out of it. So how do you fix that? Well, you know, obviously if you just put a fixed resistor here, it's going to be very dependent on your load. You know, it's, it's great if you want to make a constant current generator maybe and you put a fixed value resistor here um, and you're controlling it with a low value voltage, you know, like a VREF and a, and a small amount of current. But if you want to, if you have a varying load here, there has to be some kind of feedback in order to stabilize this one. So how do we do that? Well, let's just do a little bit of variation of what we had before. All right, um, just get rid of those signals a moment. So if we still had our op amp in here, okay, we've got plus and minus. All right, I want to set a voltage on here and I want my feedback coming into this op amp. And let's even just put our, uh, you know, just to keep it fair, let's put our 90K back in here and our 10K back in here. So this is basically your 0 to 2 volts gives you a 0 to 20 volts out. Well, that's great, but there's an immediate flaw with this. This output, it goes high to try and turn this transistor on. We need the output to go low to try and turn this transistor on. Now, you could rearrange this circuit by using the you know, 0 to 2 volts on the negative input. Um, so you just flip it around. That would potentially work, or, and this is another easier way of doing this, is you can have this drive a um, NPN transistor to ground, and then have this attached to here. All right? That alone, or you need a little limiting resistor in here, of course, that alone now will give you the exact same circuitry. The difference is you've now got a um, PNP driver stage instead of an NPN driver stage. You've still got the same control feedback. Um, it's just it's not acting in an emitter follower. So you're still stabilized, but you can probably have a bit better control here. And a lot of systems, and if you look at my uh, Martin Lawton's, he's doing a um, student bench power supply uh, circuitry, and he uses on that system a, um, an, a PNP output driver stage um, just like this, uh, I think it's a slight variation of this, and then he has a um, a low end driver. Basically, you're doing a voltage to current conversion here. So your op amp is just varying a voltage output. You're using this transistor to turn that voltage into a current. So you've got a, a couple of diode drops, a resistor, and through here, you, you're just changing the current here to be able to control it. The op amp, again, is going to do whatever it takes to keep that negative input the same as the positive input. So now we've got the 0 to 2 volts, and we have the you know, 0 to 20 volts coming out. So if you set this to 1 volt on here, then this will go to 10 volts and stabilize. All right. Um, so that pretty much covers that one. So let's uh, look at what we're going to do next. Sorry that, I didn't want to leave you in the lurch, so I just quickly redrew this with an op amp without the, um, the current transistor down here, um, just to show you that you can actually just use the op amp to drive the PNP transistors, where the output stage of the op amp is drawing the current down. What I've done is I flipped the input, so the VREF, like your varying voltage for your set point, is going to go, say, from 0 to 2 volts if you want, 0 to 20 volts out. In this case, because it's feeding into the negative input of the op amp, um, the output is still going to try and do whatever it can do to make that these two inputs exactly the same. Because we increase the negative input on this op amp relative to the positive input, the output is going to go down negative all right, towards the zero volt rail. As it does that, in this case, it's going to turn this transistor harder on which means that you're going to get more current flowing through, which is going to increase the voltage on your output here. So say it's still 10 ohms, all right? Um, if you've set one volt on here, you want to get 10 volts here, and you've got um, 10 ohm load, you want to have one amp flowing through here. 
So as soon as you've got one amp flowing through here by taking this low enough, um, so remember if this was 1K, you've got two and a half volts here, plus one volt across there would give you one milliamp, then your output now is going to be um, driving one amp through there. You're going to get 10 volts now here, so this has now come up in value. Okay, so as this has gone up here, this goes down initially. Well, let's draw it slightly differently. I take this input and I step it up to one volt. All right, this output initially is going to be high. It's going to step down to a low voltage, probably the almost the, the negative rail or the zero volt rail, sorry. Because it's dropped down, this is going to start conducting current through here. This is going to turn harder on, and then this is going, this point here is going to increase up, okay? Um, and try, and you know, it, it typically if you just left it open, it's going to hit the top, um, the, the 20 volts or less than 2 volts across this thing. It's going, so it's going to go high. Now, as this starts to go high here, this input is going to go high and it wants to go to 2 volts. So the minute it hits 2 volts, this output is start going to turn off. Off. So, you know, it's it's basically acting as a comparator initially, but the minute you get these two close together, you're going to come back into the linear region of this op amp. And so the output what it's going to do is it's going to go negative and then it's going to come back and settle down to some kind of value that make sure you've only got your so this is going to be say uh, 20 volts here this is going to maybe go down to zero volts just you know in worst case and then this is going to settle back up to 20 minus two and a half plus one three and a half so uh, 16 16.5 16 volts is where ideally that you know given all of these parameters where that would settle down Right? So then your output would probably overshoot a little bit, then settle down to where it wants to be as well. So you may get, a, you know, without some um, rate limiting, you may get a bit of ringing on here. But basically, that's how you would be able to do, um, a, you know, a PNP transistor Darlington array with just an op amp without any additional uh, circuitry here. So there's a few things you need to watch out for with circuits like this too. Um, you know, uh, this is not really so much to do with the output stages. It's more about when you have your control loop added in with say the op amp like we've shown you with the NPN and the PNP um, Darlington drivers. Um, typically op amps, you know, when you go look at them, they'll have a supply voltage range up to maybe uh, plus or minus 15 volts, you know, plus or minus 18 absolute max. So if you're sitting with a, you know, a, a 28 volt supply, you're really getting very close to the limitations of what these um, op amps can do. And these op amps also, if you don't have the right kind, they can't go rail to rail either. So they may only be able to get within two volts of the positive supply and maybe two volts of the negative, you know, of the, to, to to the zero volts. Um, typically they can do better than that, but never assume that they will actually get to zero. So if you're using um, you know, this kind of circuit and you want to be able to drive this, this, that's okay with the, um, you know, as you come on a little bit and you're coming away from the supply, but as you try and drive down lower and lower, um, you won't necessarily be able to pull enough current through here depending on your selection of this resistor um, before the op amps output would basically hit as low as it can go or hit as high as it can go. Um, conversely, if you've got a P uh, NPN transistor in this output stage, you know, you have to take this rail high in order to turn it on. So the minute you get to, you know, within a couple of volts of the positive rail, um, you may not be able to drive it anymore. And it, it, so you've got the limitations of the drop across these, you know, the, the emitter base on both the NPN and the PNP. You've also got the limitation of how close to the rails the output of your op amps can go. Now, you can get op, op amps which claim rail to rail. Um, now, they'll never actually truly get to the actual rail supply, but they'll get very, very close to it. Um, one of my target aims is I'm going to have want to have um, up to 30 volts on the output here. 
um, at, at this point, which means that up here I actually have to have probably 35 um, to 38 volts in order to have plenty of headroom to be able to drive this up to the, the, the volts I want and not have any ripple being reflected in the output. Now the problem with that is it gets a lot harder to find an op amp that will actually allow you to put you know 35 40 volts across it without damaging it and one of the you know the reasons um, the circuit I showed you before was if I just eliminate this a little bit um, leave the feedback get rid of these readings and things like that all right when I was driving this here before when I put um, a transistor here down to the zero volt rail and then I have a resistor driving this Darlington array all right this would obviously be the negative and this would be back to positive here to turn this transistor fully on I only have to take its base to you know plus 2.5 volts or something like that or not even if it's just a single transistor you know let's just say plus well let's just say plus two volts just for the sake of it there'll be a current limiting resistor in here anyway but now my op amp only has to go to about plus two volts there's still a little limitation here is that you may not be able to go low enough to turn this fully off so you know a way to fix that would be to simply put maybe a diode in here that would elevate this um, enough that the op amp even if it wasn't a rail to rail op amp would be able to turn fully off um, this transistor because even if this is only sitting at 0.6 volts they've got 0.6 here and you've got another 0.6 or more with this diode it will actually turn off but as it turns on this voltage here never will have to get anywhere near the 28 volts in order to completely control this circuit so you may only have this thing here sitting at say um, you know 12 volts or even just 15 volts and that will be perfectly fine when you use this um, voltage to basically voltage to current conversion and you're uplifting the current by putting it through this transistor now obviously the transistor itself needs to be able to take um, the full 28 volts across it but that's not hard to find you know even a 2N2222 type of uh, NPN you know it's a generic jelly bean transistor will quite happily handle 30 40 uh, 50 volts um, just check the spec sheets you know but they're a dime a dozen basically they're not expensive and it's easy to do this and that eliminates the fact that you have to have these op amps that can go right up to the high rails and the other thing as well is your voltage reference devices if you remember when we went back to the voltage reference video earlier on you know some of these voltage references they only want to work with 5 volts if it's one of the chip kinds or you know in a lot of cases maybe they'll go up to 18 volts but they don't go up to 28 or more so you know if this is your voltage reference and you've got your um, variable oops put that in the wrong place and it's feeding in here now the, the the rail that's supplying your op amp and your voltage reference and everything else can be completely separate from your output and there's another benefit to this and that is that you know whatever's happening on the power side of things if this is a separate supply from a, your big transformer and your op amp and your voltage reference and your control system is being fed from a separate um, lower voltage and you know it it's not directly coupled with this in any way then this will remain stable even if you've got a lot of variations and pulsing and everything else going on over here um, it won't be fed back through the supply rail with any noise into this control circuitry so there's a benefit to that and the same thing applies you know even if you're using the um, you know the 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 NPN um, driver I won't bother doing both of these but um, you know you've got this circuitry here if you simply and this is um, put a in this case I'm actually going to bring a PNP transistor in here now all right if you do this with an NPN driver stage all right now remember we've got a Darlington this is actually still a Darlington. let me just draw it fully in just for the heck of it all right this is your Darlington there's your output all right and this is your zero volt rail so there's your Darlington transistor now 
because I put this PNP transistor in here now at the top end, I can actually now put a um, the same thing down here and have my control op amp doing the same thing. All right. So now I've got a PNP and an MPN doing the same. Now, just very quickly, you'll be thinking to yourself, well, I just added two transistors. That's kind of a waste. Well, it's easy to resolve that. This is a Darlington power transistor pair. You don't have to do that. If you just have this as a regular power transistor, you can, you know, it's easy to build um, Darlington transistors or Darlington array without having to have specifically a Darlington transistor. So if this one is the NPN output stage, I just put a um, PNP here. It's still technically a Darlington array, but now it's combined of a PNP and an NPN. And I just put the resistor here and I drive it from this low one. Now I don't have any more transistors than what I had before. You can still have a high gain here. This could be something like a 2N3055 or something, big power transistor. Um, your and PNP here is merely acting as a converter. So you're driving a current down here, it's converting it to the high end drive that you need for this PN, uh, NPN output driver stage. Whereas here it's, um, you know, you've got a, a, a PNP and a PNP pulling down. Here I've got basically the same kind of thing, but I'm using it slightly differently um, to convert PNTP to NPN because you'll often find a, an NPN transistor will have better characteristics. You know, one of the things I didn't mention with this, this has got a higher current capability in the TIP145, um, but what it has is it's got a different gain characteristics, but it's also lower power, you know, and you're actually dropping even more volts across here. I think with this spec sheet, we'll have a look in a second, you'll find that this is as much in excess of three volts across here now instead of two and a half or less. So anyway, going back to this bottom one, with an NPN transistor array, and a PNP driving the NPN transistor, and then having the low side current conversion. So you're basically drawing a current, again, a current through here, same as you've got a current flowing through here. Now your control circuitry can be low voltage relative to your output stage. So that's a huge benefit to be able to have that um, split supply where your control doesn't have to be sharing the same output or the, certainly the same output voltage range as your um, actual output stage. All right, so that pretty much completes the video for the um, bipolar transistor drive circuitry. Uh, it's, it's taken probably close to an hour or more to do this. Um, so I'm gonna break it up into two videos. I'm gonna do the separate one for using the uh, MOSFETs. Uh, that one probably should go a little quicker because we've covered a lot of the basics in here as well. Um, so we'll, anyway, I'll uh, finish this one now and uh, start another one for the MOSFETs.